It has been a few months since we last said that we're gonna talk about using an iPad as a laptop replacement. And I find myself using this setup as my go-to portable device whenever I need to move away from my main workstation. Why? Well, it's pretty difficult to explain. Maybe it's due to the portability of this machine or maybe it's the combination of a few more features that makes this setup superior to other laptops that is made to replace. Now, that's a hot take. Anyway, the idea of a quote-unquote laptop replacement has been around for a very long time. I've been using the 5th generation iPad Air with the Apple Magic Keyboard and also the Apple Pencil, so this is a one-to-one -one comparison with our previous laptop replacement video with the Samsung Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra. Now, I'm pretty sure that many people want to get a device like this to replace their laptops. So, that is why I'm doing this video today. Okay, since we've done the Android as a laptop replacement with the Samsung Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra, you should watch that first because most of the idea of a tablet as a laptop replacement will be also applied here. So I've stated that the feasibility of a tablet to replace a laptop is pretty much dependent on your personal use case. My usage is pretty simple. I just want a device that is lag-free when I'm using Google Chrome and then it has a proper keyboard to type on and then it is able to run Spotify and YouTube at the same time. Of course, having the ability to multitask via multi-window is also necessary for my use case. The first thing I want to highlight here is actually the Apple Magic Keyboard. Now, thanks to this hinge, the iPad Air is essentially floating in the air. The main hinge rests against the table, whereas there is another hinge here that lets us adjust the tilt angle of the iPad Air. So in a way, this tilt angle makes it more comfortable for us to look at the tablet while we are doing some work. However, I initially had issues with this design. You see, the tilt angle is quite restrictive and for someone like a long body like me, I had to bend my backbone, have a hunchback to look at the screen properly even at the most extreme tilt angle. Then I realized something. This restrictive angle is actually by design. Now, let's take a conventional laptop by for comparison there. If we use it in such an extreme tilt angle, I can sit straight but then when I look down, my neck is gonna hurt. So, what Apple did for the iPad is actually to make it more restrictive so we'll have to prop this up instead to make it comfortable to look at. In a way, it is more ergonomic. So I started to use the iSwift Pi to elevate the iPad Air to a more comfortable level to be used and since then, I really like this hinge design. It saves so much space compared to a traditional kickstand design like the Microsoft Surface or even the Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra to the point that I can actually use it on the iSwift Pi at my bedside without worrying about this tablet falling off. This space saving design is also very crucial, especially in a tight space like the airplane with those fold out tables and whatnot because you don't have much depth and every centimeter counts. The trackpad on this Apple Magic Keyboard sure feels good to be used. It feels just like the MacBook's trackpad, so yeah, I don't really see any issues with it. But for some reason, Apple decided to make the cursor to be completely different from what we've been familiar on any other devices that use Windows or Mac OS. It is a circular dot that adapts to the shape depending on where the cursor is pointing at. And that is where the weirdness of the UI starts. You see, the cursor changes its shape and then it gets magnetically attached to the stuff and then engulfs the entire button. It's like how Kirby inhaled an entire car, but in certain cases, if the buttons are too close to each other, then it's quite frustrating to be used because the button just simply snaps onto one of the buttons if they are too close together. The perfect example of this is actually when you're using iPadOS 16's Stage Manager. Now speaking of Stage Manager, I've spent some time with it too since I wrote this entire script using iPadOS 16 Beta 3. I just don't prefer to use Stage Manager because I do prefer using the side-by-side -side window instead. It feels much more natural to navigate because when you use Stage Manager, it's gonna be floating windows everywhere and then it's difficult to manage. So for my use case, as mentioned earlier, I'm gonna have Google Keep on one side and then Google Chrome on another side so I can reference material while typing some script on Google Keep. And then if I ever need to hop back into Spotify, I just swipe to the multitasking window and switch to Spotify that way. And of course, switching between apps and multitasking is snappy on the M1 iPad Air so I really had no problems at all because why would it lag? 
However, not everything is sunshine and rainbow when it comes to the M1 iPad Air. There are many people saying that Apple products do not have any software bugs and I disagree. I've encountered one very annoying bug on iPad OS 15 all the way up to iPad OS 16 Beta 3 and that is the virtual keyboard. Yeah, that is not exactly a part of the laptop replacement idea but the issue is that whenever, sometimes, I just want to take out the iPad like this and then start typing something, then that issue will be annoying to me because the virtual keyboard, if you use it on an app like Facebook, for example, then it starts to jump around. I don't know why this happens, but this kind of issue only happens on Facebook itself. By the way, third-party keyboards like Gboard does not officially support floating keyboard functionality on the iPad, but there is a way to trick it. That is, if you use the Apple keyboard, make it into floating mode, and then you switch to Gboard. And then, in a way, you get floating Gboard. I don't know why this works, but it does. <laughs> but when the whole setup works, like in Google Keep, then it works really well. I typed so many scripts using the iPad Air with the Apple Magic Keyboard. And the reason why I use this setup is because whenever this MacBook Pro is rendering a video and whatnot, I tend to just pick up this entire setup, go somewhere else and start typing some other script instead. I also bring the iPad Air, this setup entirely, with me whenever I go out as well because you know, for some reason I just prefer this setup to bring out over the MacBook Pro. And since I got the Apple Pencil here, I also did some simple sketches and animation using Procreate as well. It's rudimentary but it works and I find myself using this method to explain more technical stuff more effectively essentially. So I will continue to do this in the future as well. And best of all, once I have finished drawing all of the sketches on Procreate, I can directly airdrop everything frame by frame to the MacBook Pro with just a tap of a button. That saves so much space on my table and airdrop is just a brilliant feature to have. One tap, everything gets sent through very quickly and reliably. If I am feeling particularly lazy, I can even draw on Apple Notes and then have it synced via the cloud to the MacBook Pro as well. But AirDrop is much better, honestly. Then you might say, aren't I using the iPad Air as a laptop then? Why do I still keep the MacBook Pro around? Well, these two devices have very different purposes. As mentioned earlier, I'm using the MacBook Pro as my rendering machine, whereas this one is more like a complementary device that I tend to bring out with me more often than this because this MacBook Pro tends to just get hooked up to my main workstation, that's it. I can see why Apple decided to separate iPadOS from macOS even though they both share a lot of similarities in terms of hardware and software. And because of this separation, I'm able to segregate my tasks according to device and work more efficiently and juggle between the two devices. Whenever one device is busy, then I switch to the other device. If I ever need to draw, then the iPad Air is obviously the one to get. I can't imagine every time that I want to draw, I'll need to stop everything that I'm doing on the MacBook Pro and then start drawing something simple. It might be a first world problem that I'm complaining about, but I prefer this kind of separation. I can also use the MacBook Pro in tandem with the iPad Air as well. I can use iPadOS on the MacBook Pro's keyboard and mouse and I can convert the iPad Air into an external monitor for the MacBook Pro if I ever need it too. I usually use it in the latter mode though because I just leave this iPad running some YouTube video and since it is connected using the screen sharing screen extension mode essentially, all of the audio from the iPad is also passed to the MacBook Pros as well. So I will get high quality audio while having an external screen that I can yank out whenever I need to bring this around with me. And so that's it for this video. I treat this combo as a compact, lightweight alternative whenever my MacBook Pro is busy rendering something else. And if I ever need to draw something, just pick this up, draw something, and drop it back to the MacBook Pro and continue editing that way. This is just, it streamlines the entire editing process so well that I can't see myself using some other devices with this kind of tight ecosystem integration. So that's it. That's all I have to share with you today. If you don't have a MacBook Pro, then the iPad Air is still viable, but you do need to keep note of what you need in terms of a laptop replacement. So yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comment section below. And this skin is something that I bought 
uh, off of Shopee because the white colored Apple Magic keyboard tends to get dirty with smudges and whatnot. So yeah, 